along with Psalm 23, which we read as the call to worship, the other scripture for today is John 10, 22 through 30, and it's found on page 98 in the Bibles, Pew Bibles. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. There's a story told about a mother who walked her little son to school every morning. And eventually, as the little boy grew, he began to notice that other kids were walking by themselves or with friends. They didn't need their mother to walk them to school anymore. And so he said, I want to walk with my friend. I don't want you to walk me anymore. And the mother was a little bit anxious about that. She felt like he was a bit young maybe to do this, but she wanted to honor his wishes. So she called a friend of hers down the street who had a younger daughter. She knew that woman was still going to be walking her daughter every day. And she said, could you just kind of keep an eye on the boys as you walk, as you're doing your own walk, just, just notice where they are and don't let them know you're following them. I mean, I don't, I don't want them to think I put you up to this, but could you do that? And, and the little girl's mother said, of course. So every day she would watch out the window and as the two boys walked past, she would uh, then begin her walk with her daughter and stay at a respectful distance. But after a number of days of this happening, one of the little boys said to the other, do you know who those people are? Because they are always behind us. And the little boy whose mother had set this whole thing up said, oh, that's Marcy and her mother, Shirley Goodnest. And the friend was kind of surprised because he didn't know who they were. And he said, how do you know who they are? And the little boy said, well, every night my mother makes me say the 23rd Psalm. And it says, surely goodness and Marcy will follow you all the days of your life. <laughs> so I better get used to it. All right. I'm not sure that really happened. I'm guessing <laughs> a grown-up somewhere made that story up to illustrate a point. But what would it be like if you really believe deep in your soul that goodness and mercy were going to follow you all of your life, no matter where you went, no matter what bad or good things were happening, goodness and mercy would be there. That changes things when you believe that. There's a second story, and I'm guessing this one's also made up, and it's not so funny, but it's kind of poignant about w the way kids see things. And, you know, the Bible says we're to have faith like a child. This is a good example of that. There was a Sunday school teacher who was trying to get her kids to memorize the 23rd Psalm. And it was hard. They're busy and they didn't get to practice all the time. And some kids get real scared anyway when they're asked to recite something. And so this one little girl was having trouble getting past the very first line. She would start off, the Lord is my shepherd, and, and feel like that was good. And, and then she would just go blank. So the day came where they were supposed to recite it in church. And the little girl stood on the stool that was behind the pulpit so she could see over. And she started off, the Lord is my shepherd. And then she went blank. And then she said, and that's all I need to know. It's true, isn't it? Some of us don't feel like we are Bible experts. Some of us can't quote it by memory from all different sorts of places. But if you knew just that, if you knew who you belong to, 
who is the one you are to follow. If you knew that you were loved and cared and guided all through your life, that really is about all you need to know, isn't it? So the 23rd Psalm becomes one of those things we say so often that sometimes we lose its meaning almost. It's, it's often quoted at memorial services because it talks about walking through the shadow of death. But it's considered to be a song of trust, which is a, a form of writing in the Bible. Usually those take the, the shape of there's some sort of crisis or disaster and in this case, we don't know what it is. Maybe it's walking through that valley of the shadow of death. But the person involved trusts that God is there in that crisis and that somehow, some point, everything's going to be okay. So it's interesting to note that that valley of the shadow of death isn't the only way you can translate the words. In fact, scholars these days are leaning more towards it means the valley of darkness or the deepest darkness. That any time we're walking through a, a, a troubling place in our lives, we know that God is there with us. So one of the places that we think about this is when it says, I shall not want. What does that mean, I shall not want? We always want, don't we? There's always something that we wish we could have or we wished were different. The words that are used to say, I shall not want, show up in other places in the Bible in a little bit different way. It's slightly different, but when the Hebrew people were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, the word for I shall not want was they lacked nothing. Now, if you'd talk to them, they might disagree with that interpretation because you remember they whined and complained for 40 years about what was happening. But every day, God made sure they had food. Every day, they had water. And every day, they knew that the Lord walked with them. So it's, it, there are different ways to hear this, and it's good to read different translations, I think, to shake up things that become so familiar. So when we say maybe it's not about the shadow of the valley of death, but it's when I walk through the darkest valley, that helps us to remember that this isn't a psalm about death. It's a psalm about life. God leads us to green pastures where we can be fed. God takes us to still waters where we can get drink. And God guards us even in the scariest parts of our life. Guards us not in the sense that bad things might not ever happen to us, but guards us in the sense that we know we never walk through those moments alone. And there's still another interesting translation difference where it says, goodness and mercy shall follow me. In some places, the word for follow is actually translated as pursue. What does it mean if you think about goodness and mercy are going to pursue me all of my life? Now, the little boy in this story, he and his friend probably thought Mrs. Goodnest and Marcy were pursuing them in some ways. They were following them. But isn't it a comfort to know that goodness and mercy are going to continue to come after you, no matter what you do? Even sometimes when those little boys want to go their own way, when we want to go our way and wander off and not have God with us, Goodness and mercy are going to be there, no matter what. So the part that we read in John's Gospel this morning is just a small part of what Jesus had to say about being a good shepherd in chapter 10. He was causing a lot of division among people. So our faith does that, right? The Methodist Church doesn't have an exclusive hold on being divided about what Scripture means. Jesus called, caused all kinds of controversy. And some people had come to say, yes, this is the long-awaited Messiah, and they were thrilled. And other people literally were saying, this man's out of his mind. He's got a demon in him. We should not pay any attention to him. 
So there's all this controversy going on. And in the passage that John read, the people are gathered in Jerusalem. And there's a lot of them because this is the festival of dedication, which we now call Hanukkah. So the Jewish folks are all there to be celebrating. And Jesus is walking on this thing called the Portico of Solomon. It's, it's kind of like a porch, but it's at the temple. It is an important place. And this crowd gathers around him, and some of them are saying, you know, we don't believe you, and some of them are saying, we do believe you. And so someone in the crowd says, just tell us. You know, don't pussyfoot around. Are you the Messiah or are you not? And Jesus says, I have told you. And you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you don't believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. In other words, he's saying, I don't have to tell you in words. Can't you see it? I am showing you all the time. But if you have a mindset that says, I don't want to believe this man is the Messiah, you can discount all kinds of things. Even miracles can be explained away. Someone once asked Louis Armstrong to define the kind of music called swing. And he answered, if you have to ask, you may never know. <laughs> in other words, it was something that couldn't be explained in words. It's something that you have to feel. If you dance it, maybe you will understand what it is. But just talking about it isn't going to get you there. And that's kind of how it is with recognizing Jesus in your life. It's something you experience rather than something that you can intellectually figure out. So what does it mean that some people don't belong to his flock? This is a passage that gets used to exclude some people that you can't possibly be among the flock. So what's going to happen to these people? Well, it should come maybe as no surprise to you that I think they're going to get into the flock eventually. Jesus is saying at this moment, they don't recognize his voice the way the sheep who have learned to depend on the shepherd do. The sheep that are already in the fold are there because they get it. They're listening to his voice. They know he loves them. They know he's taking care of them. They trust him. The others aren't there yet, but that doesn't mean they're never going to get it. That doesn't mean they're left out in the cold forever. Because in the earlier parts of the chapter, Jesus says that he has other sheep that don't belong to this fold and that he must bring them also. And they will listen to his voice. So he says there'll be one flock, one shepherd. Little children and sheep don't ask their caretakers to explain in words that they are loved. They know that. Every time they are held and they are fed and they are talked to and they are cared for, they feel that love. You don't have to explain it in words. Words might just mess up the feeling. But as children grow older, they often test that kind of love. Anybody that's raised an adolescent knows what I'm talking about. People can wander out of the fold. They may have been in at one time, and they wander out. They don't listen for a while to their parents' voices. But lots of parents will tell you that when their children were first little, it seemed as though the children believed the parent knew everything. And then comes this adolescent period where it appears parents know absolutely nothing. But sometime later, if all goes well, those same children come back as young adults and say, wow, you were right all along. You really know a lot about the world and about raising children. Jesus doesn't tell us who those other sheep are. But they are the ones that aren't in the fold that the people he's talking to think they are in. And he says he must bring these other ones along too. They will listen, not they do now, or not they never will, but they will at some times listen to his voice. But maybe just not right now. 
We live in uncertain times. There are tensions between nations that we read about and hear about on the news. There are deep divisions in our country with respect to politics and what directions we should take. Our denomination is threatening to split apart, and no one seems to know what a new denomination might look like if indeed there is a split. All we know that it is, will be inclusive. But our scripture this morning assures us that we don't have to have the answers to all the questions that are swirling around out there. We don't have to live in the fear and the unsettled moments that frighten us because even when we walk through the darkest valleys, the good shepherd is there to guide us. We don't have to know how he does it. We don't have to know how everything is going to turn out. We just have to listen to his voice, trust in his love and his care, and follow him. May we have the faith to do just that, knowing that goodness and mercy will be pursuing us all the days of our lives. Amen.